And circling back to your original question, that's why I was most compelled to pick evolutionary astrology because it had that ingredient, reading the karma of the chart by looking at the nodes of the moon in the birth chart in a very specific way. So there was that, and also it just fit with my general philosophy that the whole purpose of life is to learn, grow, and evolve. And that's, I, th I believe that's why we're here. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys Podcast. This is going to be your episode for July 27th through August 2nd, 2020. And today on the show, we will be speaking with Brian Coulter. He is an evolutionary astrologer, so definitely stay tuned for that. But before we get into the interview, we need to do our forecast. And we'll start with talking about the card of the week for this past week, which was the Three of Wands. So... Did you vibe with the Three of Wands this past week? Definitely. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Scarlet's making a, a tarot deck. And I am the Three of Wands in that deck. So I, re I love that card in general. Um, and it's what's crazy about that card being drawn. So for the full forecast last week, our patrons heard Scarlet give the full description. And sometimes, Scarlet, you like throw in these little tidbits about the card where I'm like, where did that come from? Like a little detail that ends up being very true. And last week you were like, yeah, if you're a musician, you should go out and find gigs. And I was like, are you talking to me specifically? But weirdly... I got some gigs. I'm getting paid to play music now in my um, 2020 like unemployment adventure. So that was amazing. Like I'm like making money playing music in my little vacation town, which is awesome. So um, that definitely came true. I applied for some other jobs. So I I definitely think that card came true for me. Um, what about you though? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, since that card is a lot about expansion, I've been working on um, creating a course. So I am starting that process, going through it. It's obviously going to take a while to complete, but um, I've been feeling really inspired to try new things like creating a course, for example. Um, and also the idea of expansion too, since I'm in the process of packing everything up, I'll be moving to Texas next week, I feel like that itself is this kind of crazy expansion, this crazy adventure that I'm about to embark on. So I've been preparing for that and thinking about that a lot. So yeah, I was I was pretty pleased with getting that card last week. I feel like it brought a really positive presence into my life. And it sounds like for you as well. Yeah, it, it's um, I love the wands cards. And we've had two weeks in a row with wands and even before we've had a lot of wands in 2020 so as we're getting ready to pull next week's card i feel like i'm in like gambling mode like come on give me a good one let's see a good one so i would i would totally <laughs> be happy with another wand wands card yeah and next week there's a lot going on so i mentioned i'm gonna be um traveling to to my new home next week and then also on August 1st, we have Lamas or Lunasa, um, which is a pagan holiday. It's the first of the three harvest festivals. Um, and then on the second, that's Dan's birthday, right? <laughs> I'm. It is my birthday. I'm turning 33, getting old Ooh. as dirt. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a Lamas baby, I guess. Yeah. So we got a lot going on next week it's it's pretty intense so hopefully we get a good card to to bring us through mm -hmm. um just giving the cards a bit of a shuffle and then we will be ready so we just pulled the card of the week what would you like to highlight about this special card we got for this special week well it's a pretty intense one um and it is a card of transformation, but it's also a card that tells us we need to 
actively remove the things in our life that are no longer serving us. So expect a bit of intensity (laughs) this upcoming week, but it's not all bad. I mean, I think this transformative time is always going to lead to a new stage in our life that will hopefully be more aligned with our wider purpose. So a pretty intense one. Of course, if you do want to hear the card of the week and get the full forecast, you can join our community on Patreon. So what would do you want to highlight about the astrology for next week? So next, th- this upcoming week, we have a pretty busy week in astrology. The past few weeks, I've kind of been like, here's what's going on. I can give it to you in the free version of the forecast, but we have a lot of aspects. So what to highlight? Well, uh, at the start of the week, uh, the moon is going to enter Scorpio, and that's going to be the half moon which is the halfway point between the new moon and the full moon. The full moon will be next Monday in Aquarius on August 3rd. So we're kicking the week off with this tense half moon in Scorpio. And on, in the beginning of the week, um, this whole week has a lot of Mercury and Neptune placements or aspects. Neptune is that dissolving force Um the shadow side of it, as we talk about in this interview, is addiction, escapism, you know, tuning out of reality. And the positive side of it is reaching for higher spiritual ideals and, you know, connecting with the divine, merging with the divine. So with on Monday, I'll highlight that we have Jupiter sextile Neptune. So that is this is the second of three hits that's going to be occurring because Jupiter in Capricorn is retrograde at the moment. And this is a big, large scale thing. We probably were feeling it last week. Jupiter is the planet of expansion, good fortune, good luck, philosophy. Neptune, as I said, is that merging force, which is dissolving boundaries and bringing you closer to a higher spiritual ideal. So this is going to be a like very spiritual week in terms of Jupiter sextiling Neptune. And we're going to be feeling that all through the week, probably into next week. We were probably feeling it last week. So this is a big chapter in the year, big section of 2020 is this outer planet aspect. And then at the same time, at the same day, Venus is going to make its third square to Neptune. Um, because Venus went retrograde in Gemini, and this is kind of re- really closing out that Venus retrograde in Gemini story. And with Venus square Neptune, this can make this can cause relationship fantasies and delusions. It's something to be careful for. If you fall in love with somebody on Monday, Wait a couple days before you make any significant um, commitments, or because so, there is that tendency with Venus being your relationships squaring Neptune, which is this like fantasy planet. Um, just be careful that you don't misinterpret things or fall for something that's not actually real, because Neptune can be very deceptive. There's a lot of other stuff happening this week, but. Um, if you want to hear it all, you're just going to have to join us on Patreon for five bucks a month. Um, you will support the show, get the full forecast with the full card of the week, plus episode extensions and a lot of other benefits. So to learn more, go to patreon.com slash cosmic keys. And stay tuned for our interview coming up with Brian Coulter, who is an evolutionary astrologer.
So today on the Cosmic Heats podcast, we are speaking with Brian Coulter. Brian is an astrologer focusing in on evolutionary astrology. So we're really excited to have him on our show today. So Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited about this. Yeah, for anybody that um, hasn't already seen them, Brian has a really great YouTube channel um, where he does great astrology content. So we're that's how I discovered you. And I only discovered you somewhat recently, but I'm excited to talk about evolutionary astrology because that's a branch of astrology that we haven't really covered as much on this show, minus for the very first episode where we interviewed my original astrologer in Chicago, and he was an evolutionary astrologer, but we haven't really um, explored that as much lately, so I'm excited to talk about that. Um, But before we get there, we usually start off with bio info. So Brian, could you tell us a little bit about your early life and um, whether you were raised with religion at the start of your life? Oh, religion. Uh, Well, uh, religion was around. I wouldn't say it was a major shaper of my early childhood. Uh, my mom was uh, a Christian, but she wasn't overly, I guess, dogmatic about it. Although uh, there was times where I, I would go to Sunday school and such. Uh, my mom was pretty open-minded, and um, she introduced me to things like tarot and numerology. So I was kind of at least exposed to uh, these esoteric or tools of divination at an early age. Of course, I didn't uh, really dive into it till later in life, but uh, religion uh, wasn't a big part of the mix, although I was exposed to it mildly. Yeah, that's pretty cool that you had such open um, childhood and you were exposed to some of those divinatory tools so early. So when did astrology come into the mix for you? Oh, much later. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, even when she was she was doing my numerology, and I think I'm a, a three life path. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, it sounds cool. But, you know, I didn't know, really know what to do with it or, 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 or think of it. Uh, I would say it resonated with me, but I wasn't like wowed by it, you know. Um, and then I think my transition happened uh, back towards this direction in my late 20s, actually. And we could make this semi-instructional for your audience since you know, they seem to have an interest in astrology. Is right around my Saturn return. And you can pretty much ask any astrologer on the planet what's like one of the biggest events you can experience in a lifetime. Uh, most of them will say Saturn return, or at least that'll be in the top three. It's a big event. And the first Saturn return happens uh, around oh, I don't know, 29, 30, sometimes 28, kind of depends on when you're born, kind of has a, in the retrograde cycle and such. So it's not the exact same for everybody. But how it is the same is it serves as a major pivot point from the first third of life, I guess you could say, it's not reliable mathematically, into the, the second third of life or from, uh, from youth into midlife. So it's a time of great change, of pivoting. And um, after and during my Saturn return is really when I started to dabble in subjects like spirituality, uh, self-discovery. And I was very much, I guess you could say, a different person, or at least I had a different lifestyle pre-Saturn return. So it'll be, I guess I should talk about that a little bit, kind of give you the juxtaposition between how I live my life now and then then, uh, which of course led me to astrology. So uh, pre-Saturn return, I had a very uh, self-serving lifestyle. Uh, I was, uh, uh, right before my Saturn return, I was actually a professional poker player, you know, on my poker. Oh, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, And uh, I really enjoyed it. But, you know, after you play millions of hands of poker, it turns from a game into a, a boring job. But, hey, you know, I still enjoyed it. Gave me a lot of freedom. Of course, made a lot of money at it. I was pretty good at it, you know. Um, but that's what I mean by kind of like service to self. It's pretty, you're not really helping anybody, you know, <laughs> being a professional <laughs> poker player. Uh, and I was probably, I guess you could say addicted to it. And I, that's how I would define my 20s really is addiction, you know. 
um, and uh, substance abuse. I was a major stoner, so I wasn't, you know, into the heavy stuff, you know, so pretty mild just in terms of it as addiction goes. But I loved uh, smoking pot and playing video games and playing poker and basically escaping from reality, you know, mm -hmm. and numbing the pain is really the root of it. And that's also very obvious in my birth chart. I didn't know astrology then, but hey, I have uh, Neptune conjunct my son in the fifth house of pleasure and games. And for those of you that know Neptune, that which has a pretty wild sp uh, swing in terms of polarity between light and dark, the dark is addiction. And then the high end is spirituality and connecting to God and meditation. So I was definitely in the dark side of Neptune in the fifth house in my 20s. I like to say kind of jokingly, it's like I uh, rolled up my 20s in a fat dube and smoked it. Like I barely remember that decade, you know. But then my Saturn return hit and my life just changed completely. Uh, that was right around uh, 2010. And online poker became illegal in the U.S. And the, every poker player knows, at least online poker player, calls it Black Friday. It was, it was Friday. I think it was on tax day in 2010. It immediately became illegal, okay, because the DOJ said so. And then my assets got frozen. So all of a sudden, I was a kind of a baller poker player living the high life to being unemployed and broke in overnight. Uh, and that was a very Saturn return type of event, it really knocked me on my butt. And around that time, I also sobered up. And through synchronicity and also interest that started to change within me, now that I had clarity of mind, I naturally started getting led towards uh, spirituality, self-discovery. I had to grew a voracious appetite for anything that helped me learn about myself. And I think intuitively, I knew that my addictive behavior, its roots was an emotional pain, you know, from childhood. And then I started naturally, again, before I knew what astrology was, going towards high-end Neptune, developed a daily meditation practice, and I got very interested in the Myers-Briggs personality test. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's your um, Myers-Briggs? Uh, well, I haven't taken it in many years, so it might have changed a little bit. But back then, I was a, an INFP. Okay, cool. And the F was kind of teetering on the halfway point between T and F. So kind of like INTP, INFP. So I'm ENFP. All right. All right. So but, just, yeah. Yeah. And that, funny enough, that was kind of um, similarly, I discovered that in college and that was long before astrology, but it's kind of, mm -hmm. it's kind of similar, especially the fact that. I feel like there is like a connection with like the four elements with that system in a way. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. What about, what are you Scarlett? Do you know? I'm an INFJ. So okay. yeah, I mm -hmm. think that's one of the more unusual ones. <laughs> There's not as many people that are that. Um, mm. But, but that's interesting what you mentioned, Dan, about there possibly being some elemental aspects to it too. Cause it also makes me think, with the Myers Briggs, I always connect it to the court cards in tarot because there's 16 court cards that all represent different personalities too. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of a neat system. Yeah, and I'm I'm just curious too, Brian, because you're as we record, you're in Portugal right now. But where you're you grew up American? Mm -hmm. Like, what part yeah. of the country were you raised? In? Uh, I was born in Seattle, but I was raised primarily in uh, Car in uh, Carmel, California, which is the central coast. California. Okay, nice. Oh, wow. I've heard that area is beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very blessed to live in that area. Yeah. So what took you to Portugal then? Uh, well, I got married. Yeah, my oh. wife's Portuguese. And, nice. And I actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I met her uh, online uh, when I was still in California we were taking an online class together and actually the class was kind of a hybrid it was a local class where i was living in california but then the teacher uploaded it to the net and then there was this group of students all over the world and it was a class in uh, Taoist mysticism yeah mm -hmm. and uh, so there's a common interest there and uh, the rest is history you know fell in love here i am <laughs> yeah it, it's it's cool that you um you know that your Saturn return 
lined up with that sort of change in lifestyle. I'm curious what your Saturn placement is, like what sign and house and how that kind of did, did any of that correlate with the lifestyle change itself? Well, it involved, uh, moving, you know, my, uh-huh. my Saturn's in the fourth house of home, Okay, but there was the sense of like getting away from family, separation from family, not in an extreme sense. Um, but this feeling of getting away from home, mm-hmm. you know, finding some level of separation from family and entering into the midlife cycle. That's what the Saturn is from youth to midlife. Okay. So becoming less reliant on them and more self-reliant uh, and just going my own way, going my own path. Yeah, it's in the sign of Libra, yeah, okay, right there on the okay. nadir at the beginning of my fourth house. It's also next to Pluto. And that was a very Plutonian time for me in terms of um, introspection, like fierce introspection and doing shadow work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we will... It's yeah, with the so you're Pluto and Libra generation then, so um it's it's interesting uh how the Saturn return kinda I mean it 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 seems like spirituality fits into that time period often. Like the two of us, Scarlett and I met during both of our Saturn returns and um for me it's when it's when astrology also like really became serious and um i'm i'm about to turn 33 and when i look back at those years i'm sort of like yeah that set all the foundation for what i'm like really sort of arriving at now like astrology is way more of a part of my life and like doing creative artistic things that the saturn return really brought that to the front forefront for me as well so it's it's for real like it's a major um you know change typically so that's cool yeah. that you discovered it back then yeah and uh i don't know if you guys are familiar with uh edgar casey have you, ever, have you heard of him before yeah the the, the so-called uh, sleeping prophet from the 20th century and he started off as a medical intuitive um uh, i think he had something like a documented like 98 percent accuracy in terms of helping people to heal. Wow. And of course, people that found him was probably a lot of them was the last resort, you know, after they'd been through the ringer of, of uh, you know, traditional medicine. And, he, and uh, he would help people heal, even from deadly illnesses. But then later in life, he transitioned more to like, um, when he was in deep trance, more spiritual and philosophical questions. And there was a variety of times where he was asked about astrology and the meanings of the planets and such. And he called Saturn the bringer of change. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the way I see the Saturn turn mainly is a major course correction. You know, it's like whatever is not serving you in that, in your life at that point, which usually is a byproduct of what you've manifested in your cycle of the youth will start to fall by the wayside or leave your life. And what is more in alignment with, your optimal trajectory as you head into your midlife starts to show up in your life. So it's out with the old in with the new kind of changes, usually a variety of both. And, you know, the universe or God or whatever you want to call it's grabbing you by the ears and uh, gently or sometimes not so gently, you know, showing you the way of the direction you're meant to head for through for this uh, this midlife cycle. So yeah. the advice for it is to go with the flow, you know, just <laughs> Yeah, you're not going to beat Saturn. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. when I made the transition where I was working like traditional corporate style jobs during my Saturn return is when I decided to leave all of that and try to work full time mm-hmm. as a tarot reader and uh, oh. instructor and everything like that, which is what I do now. So yeah, it's it's interesting that it sounds like with you, it kind of sent you on this trajectory of astrology same thing with dan and then pretty much similar with me we kind of all (laughs) became Mm. more spiritually minded during this time in our lives and it's put us on this very different trajectory than when we where we were headed before um yeah Yeah, certainly sent me on a spiritual direction (laughs) i didn't find astrology till a few years later but um Mm. 
you know, that's when I started to get interested in the Myers-Briggs, which, as you said, is very interesting, uh, uh, similar. And I've been interested in, in uh, like Dan, trying to f- think about the connection between the two. Of course, don't have the time, really, <laughs> but it's always been a fascination of mine. Uh, and then I got into uh, energy work, energy healing. I started studying medical Qigong, um, reconnective healing. I got really good at that. But there was always something missing from it. I'm like, what is it? What's missing here? And what I realized is people, my clients would come in, they'd lay down on the massage table. I would shower them in good juju. They leave, feel happy, you know. Uh, but it's like, what's missing here? And it, 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 there was no uh, communication, you know, or little. Mm-hmm. And there, there, it was missing the counseling aspect is what I realized. Mm-hmm. And um, my birth chart, astrology chart, has a really strong Mercury. I got Mercury next to my son. I got a Virgo moon in the third house, you know, so very mercurial house. And uh, that was the ingredient that was missing in, in that practice. And then eventually I found astrology and I had already been exposed to astrology. Actually, my first astrology reading was during my Saturn return. Now that I think about it. Um, And then I even had one or two more after that, but I wasn't that impressed. You know, I was like, ah, that's interesting. You know, kind of like my attitude around the uh, numerology and the Tarot when I was a youngster. Uh, And my lack of interest in astrology, at least at first, or at least not being impressed, probably had more to do with, you know, the astrologers I was sitting with more than the actuals. (laughs) You know, obviously I've dedicated my life to it now. Uh, But later on, synchronistically, I got a a free reading from a friend who just did it as a hobby, who studied with Richard Tarnas. Mm -hmm. I just started his book, Cupid and Psyche, uh, yesterday. I just, I'm just starting to read it. It's really fascinating. Cosmos and Psyche, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. Not keep it in psyche, cosmos and psyche. You got, right. I, I didn't oh, yeah. know you were reading that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have an well, esoteric book club with a few other girls, and we always pick a book for each yeah. month and <laughs> meet yeah. up. It's fun. That mm. one's chocked full of information. And, uh, you know, go to the uh, Saturn and Pluto chapter if you want a little sneak peek into this year, 2020. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's pretty crazy when you start reading Richard's words in that book and then realize what's gone on this year. It's like, oh, my God, can't make this stuff up. Um, But I don't know too much about his work, although I've heard him talk quite a bit. Um, It's my understanding, I could be wrong in this, that he primarily uses the planets, not so much the signs and houses, although I could be wrong in that. I've heard that too, yeah. Yeah. And the person who gave me this reading was doing it that way, just reading the planets, how they interact in my chart. And I was pretty blown away. I was like, whoa, there is something to this. And then um, I'm a Sagittarius. So kind of like when I learned about uh, Myers-Briggs, what did I do? I bought four or five books on the subject and jumped in. (laughs) That's a very Sagittarius way. Same thing with astrology. Bought a bunch of books, picked somebody I wanted to study with, which was Stephen Forrest, and I jumped in. But I still wasn't convinced. I kind of wanted to go in to disprove it. But the more I studied it, the more I was convinced in its efficacy. Mm-hmm. So so you basically, um, when you say you studied with, you studied with Stephen Forrest, actually, like, did you, you did like a, was it some kind of like um, online thing that you were doing? Or was it in person? Uh, he does uh, in-person workshop intensives. Okay. Um, and, of course, you know, I was in California, and he had uh, yearly classes that he would do, workshops that he would do. He'd do one in Southern and one in Northern California. He does them all over the world, although he's kind of scaled back his, his teaching schedule nowadays. But, yeah, I, I – uh, again, kind of jumped right in. I, I, I think I went to two or three, maybe even four workshops the first year. Um, and with his apprenticeship program, once you go to, uh, I don't know if it's changed nowadays, but back then, if you go to one of his live workshops, then you gain access to some of his other workshops that he, he'd done in years past that he recorded that you could buy on his online store where just... Um, and that was reserved only for his people in his apprenticeship program. So I'd go to his live events, 
and then of course I'd go home and, you know, buy some of the other seminars too and uh, read his books and really just jumped in. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. So, so back, back then when you were first, you know, getting introduced to it all, did you, um, like, were did you choose evolutionary astrology or did Stephen Forrest just kind of happen to be the most convenient teacher? Like, I'm curious how, how ev- evolutionary astrology specifically kind of found you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll put in air quotes by chance. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's see. That was a while ago. I remember. So, as I first started diving in, that's what I wanted to do, is I wanted to figure out what style of astrology I wanted to study. Uh, and I started watching YouTube videos, you know, just kind of see what's out there, different styles, different approaches. And I was watching a video, I think it was called like Astrology 101 or something like this. Um, and it was a good lecture. I was listening to it. I was liking it. And he mentioned Stephen Forrest was the Yoda of astrology. <laughs> and uh, he kind of just kind of an offhanded comment. But I heard it, you know, because I like, I like Star Wars. Um, I was like, Ooh, I want to study with Yoda. Let's check this guy out, you know? And I Googled Stephen Forrest and I found his website. And back in those days, his website, you'd go to his website and it would be a big picture of his face, like right there. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. it was the homepage. And as soon as I saw, you know, looked into his eyes for the picture, I was like, ah, this is my teacher before I heard a word he said, you know, I think that's maybe me tapping into that Neptune conjunct the sun. I just had, there's been, a couple moments in my life where I've just had a lightning bolt of an intuitive flash of I'm meant to go this way. Most of the time it's a muddled mess in my mind, you know, argumentative committee in my mind and my heart saying, should I do that? Should I not do that? You know, back and forth. But this one, I was pretty clear. And his teaching style uh, turned out to really work well with my learning style. It was really a perfect fit is I would say general life philosophy fit really well with me. But I think the most important thing was evolutionary astrology itself really fit nicely with me. Back when I came out of the cave, you know, uh, Saturn return, and I started to inhale books, uh, one of them, and one of the most impactful books in my journey has been, uh, was A Journey of Souls by Michael Newton. Have you guys heard of that one before? No, I'm going to write Isn't that, that down. Isn't <laughs> that the, wasn't Michael Newton the, um, like, life before, or life, life between lives guy? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I think I, I had an audio book or two, but yeah, he, he's, he's big with, like, the between lives um, studies, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. And can- yeah. Sorry. Can you explain to what evolutionary astrology is? Because I'm personally not very familiar <laughs> with it. Yes. And I'm sure some of our listeners would love to know. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll talk all about it. And, and I guess one of the main things that separates it from other styles is, is it uses the reincarnational model. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So through that method, we can read uh, the past life or at okay. least symbolically the past life you know, and tell a parable that parallels past life experience. Um, and that's kind of why I introduced uh, the journey of souls, because that introduced me to the idea of reincarnation as a possibility. Before that, I didn't really understand, didn't hang my hat on a belief system. I guess I would say it was a pretty open-ended agnostic. I don't know, you know, I'll just resign on that. But that book was, and I'll get to your question in just a second, but that book really opened my eyes to this being a strong possibility of kind of what goes on because he's a doctor that over decades did thousands of case studies with his patients, guiding them into, um, there's a whole story behind this too, which I won't get into, but guiding them through hypnotherapy into the spirit world. He figured out how to do that. And he had thousands of people describing the same place. Oh, interesting. They didn't know each other. They were describing the spirit world, what it's like in, as he coined it, the life between lives. 
-hmm. And to me, that was compelling evidence for reincarnation. And that's where I really adopted that belief system, which of course is a common belief system you'll find in many places all over the world. That's one huge mountain of data that points to that. Another huge mountain would be near-death experiences. Hundreds yeah. of thousands of people. Yeah, talking about We've that. We've talked about that on, on our show before too. I'm really fascinated by that. Yeah. Um, when these people had these common um, experiences of the space between lives, what were some of the things they described it as that was common? Well, uh, much like the near-death experiences, uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes it was going into the light. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a lot of times during these past life regressions, he started off doing past life regressions uh, when he stumbled on it. Before that, he was a staunch atheist, but he accidentally, again, in air quotes, by chance, <laughs> actually stumbled into actually doing a past life regression with somebody on the table. If you want me to talk about that story, I can. And then he had to like, it was a major paradigm shift for him. He's like, uh Oh, what was that? What just happened? Um, but uh, yeah. So he would often through the past life regression, go through the death sequence of one of the lives. And then he'd guide them and say, what happens after that? You know, and they would go into the light. They would be oftentimes met by um, their soul family. Sometimes their uh, spirit guide, you know, uh, and then they would go towards uh, this room and then they'd sit. Oh, first they do the life review after they met with their soul family. It's like the soul family kind of guides them into the spirit world. And then they immediately have a life review of the life they just had. And in the life review, they, it's almost like watching a movie. They see everything that goes on almost like they're watching a 3d movie. It's like a hologram but they're seeing it from the perspective perspective of outside of themselves, almost like they're seeing it from the perspective of the other people they were interacting in these various events that they're replaying. Mm -hmm. And they can experience directly how they made the other people feel, whether it was lovely or terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what they get the life review, see all the wonderful things they did and then see where they mess up. And then they go in front of the so-called council of elders. I don't know what he called it. That's just when I, it's been many years since I read the book where you will kind of talk about the life that you just had amongst these elder souls who no longer incarnate. And then after that, you go back to your so-called uh, soul family or soul pod. We all have soul mates, you know, groups of anywhere from 10 to 20 souls that we incarnate with continually. It's like we return to our family and within those 10 to 20 souls, there's usually two to three that we are our favorites, you know, would be probably called equivalent to nowadays uh, uh, new age vernacular would be the twin flames, probably something like that. And you connect with those. It's like returning home. And then uh, there's also a dynamic where uh, you're at somewhat of a school where you're with fellow students reviewing the life that you just had. And then eventually when you're ready, free will trumps all, you're allowed to come back when you want and you can pick your upcoming life, your environment, meaning your location on the planet, and you choose the parents that you can be born through. Wow. And this experience, this string of experiences re was repeated over and over and over and over by countless people who didn't know each other and describing it slightly differently uh, with different language a little bit because they were, of course, it was filtering through their own subconscious mind and how they perceived reality. But they were all basically describing the same process in the same place. And, I, and that was just, I mean, that changed my life, that book, you know. So, and that's what, uh, it's like, I became really fascinated in past lives and reincarnation and studying people like Ian Stevenson, who has gone all over the world and studied little kids like two to four years old who can speak other languages where they weren't born, recall the names of their past lives, can describe their past lives, which, which in some cases he verified by studying these people. Miraculous stories of little kids remembering their past lives before they forget. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. Forget by the time they're seven, so. <laughs> And circling back to your original question, that's why I 
was most compelled to pick evolutionary astrology because it had that ingredient, reading the karma of the chart by looking at the nodes of the moon in the birth chart in a very specific way. So there was that, and also it just fit with my general philosophy that the whole purpose of life, I'm a Sag, so I'm getting on my soapbox here for a second here, if you'll indulge me, is to learn, grow, and evolve. And that's, I, th- I believe that's why we're here. And that's right, it cooked in the name, evolutionary astrology. So it, it, the foundation of, the, uh, of this approach is that we're here to do just that, grow. And in reading the symbols, the planets and the signs and the houses, presents your blueprint of the psyche. It's, it's a deep dive into your psychology, the birth chart and some descriptors of your personality traits. That's what is similar to other styles of astrology. But as an evolutionary astrologer, I want to really be keen to understand, okay, what are your paths of evolution? What are the soul contracts here? Yes, what are your gifts and passions? And what's your cosmic job description? What's your destiny, so to speak? But where's the growth? Where's the action? And I like to say in kind of a cheeky way where you got planets in your birth chart, you've got problems, meaning that's where you're really meant to grow through the most. And your chart is like a hologram that comes to life as your consciousness filters through it. And that, of course, has a wide spectrum of potentials, an extreme high end and an extreme low end. So I try to present, okay, here's you amazing you. Here's sucky you so that you with your own conscious awareness can kind of pinpoint where you are on that scale between light and dark and strive towards the best version of yourself. And that's how we can transcend the more descriptive form of astrology into prescriptive. It's like, okay, you're a Virgo. Great. I love that sign. But why were you born a Virgo? And what can you do in your life to become an even better Virgo? These are the questions I really juggle with continually with the style is why. Always trying to dig deeper with why. And you can do that with the past life reading as well. It's like the chart behind the chart, giving a deeper layer of context. Why do you have the birth chart that you have in this life? And I believe it's rooted in your karma. So I think that there's some similarities to other styles of astrology, of course. But I think the evolutionary piece, focusing on that, grow for our own betterment and evolution. And then, of course, uh, the understanding of the karmic conditioning and the history that tends to repeat itself in the current life from past life experience. Yeah. um, Like I referred to earlier, my first astrologer or first astrology reading was like really powerful for me. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that my astrologer, Brian Alamana, in Chicago, he has a business called Soul Rise Astrology. They just he just talked like that language that he used really clicked when I was I didn't really know much about astrology at all. I knew I was a Leo. Um, but he the way my first astrologer phrased everything was like look, you have a lot of perhaps past life experience in this area. Like you're here to grow in this incarnation. And I had sort of, sort of similar to you, like kind of new agey concepts in my head at the time, even though I wasn't an expert in, you know, the Zodiac or the planets, but that was sort of like what got me hooked in a way was like, this makes sense. Like I feel like it makes sense that I've been a soul on a path and even the name evolutionary astrology it's like you are evolving your soul through these experiences and the chart um is sort of like the perfect roadmap to it um i'm just curious too in terms of evolutionary astrology what is like you mentioned like doing like a past life reading like what are like the techniques to really zone into like past lives like are there any special indicators or is it kind of like the chart as a whole sort of indicates it well actually if you look at it, uh this way the entire chart is karmic yeah because you know? you're you're born with the chart you were born with for a reason okay so there's this way of looking at that 
that's kind of big picture stuff. So it's all related to karma because they're all paths of evolution. But you can even look at your karma more precisely by focusing on the south node of the moon. Now, just a uh, distinction here. There are two different schools of evolutionary astrology. There's the Stephen Forrest School and the Jeffrey Wolf Green School. And uh, they're two different. They, they, the core philosophy of, the, of, the, of, their, of their styles is the same, to evolve. And they actually both created it at the same time, separate from each other back in you know, the 70s or 80s. Uh, and they even used the same name. And then they said, hey, wait, you know, you're stealing my name here. And they got together and they, uh, you know, had an arm wrestle over it. You know, I'm uh, being silly, obviously. But well, when they started talking, sorry. Was, uh, sorry to interrupt. Wasn't Jeffrey Wolf Green sort of channeling the information? Uh, I don't know. Okay, I don't know yeah. enough about his, his school. Uh, I've heard him speak and he was like a genius a lot of the stuff he was saying, to be honest, was over my head, at least when I first started uh, studying astrology. Um, but uh, they, Jeff and Steve, actually got together and wrote a book, I think actually two books together. They realized that, oh, both of our approaches, although slightly different, the same end goal. So really the heartbeat of it was the same. So they kind of said, oh, you, let's both keep the name, you know, honor each other's individual styles and move on from there. So the Jeffrey Wolf Green School, I think, focuses more on Pluto, mm. connecting to the past life, whereas Stephen's school, the one I practice, focuses primarily on the south node of the moon and, the, of course, the sign in the house that the south node is in, but then the planet that rules the south node sign. Every sign has a ruler, as you know. Uh, some, of, some of them have two rulers. And then we take into consideration the sign and house of, of the rulership and then any planets interacting with the nodes or the rulers. So that's kind of, you ask for the technicalities of it. So yeah. that's it in a pistachio nutshell. It's interesting um, in terms of Scarlet and I, I think our nodes are like opposite. Like um, my North node is in the sixth house and hers, her South node is in the sixth house. So mm -hmm. like we're sort of being pulled <laughs> in complementary directions, but um, I I'm it's interesting. I definitely relate to my South Node in the twelfth house because I can be like very twelfth house, like in La La Land, like up in my head, like hermit style. And I'm still kind of struggling with my six. Like I wish I was better at six house things, and maybe I'm getting there, but. I can't quite say that my north node in the sixth house is like, I'm not like a sixth house master. Let's just say that at 32. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, nobody is a master of their north node house and sign, you know, mm. because I mean, the sixth house, or excuse me, the south node is past uh, in this, in this context, past lives. It's habitual, been there, done that kind of energy. Hence why you're kind of, you're just kind of in that natural 12th house person. So that's the energy your soul is used to being immersed in, in the last life or set of lives. The North node, however, is opposite from where you've come from. You know, most people never reach their North nodes because it's foreign. It's exotic. It's opposite from where we've come from karmically. So it's unnatural. It's like trying to brush your teeth with your left hand mm -hmm. if you're right-handed. You know, it, and it takes tremendous effort and force of will and consistency and hard work to get you to your north node because we all suck at it. You know, I'm opposite with you. I got the south node of the sixth house. I'm trying to get to the twelfth house. Notice how we all have it going, rocking on the sixth twelfth. <laughs> yeah, it's right. funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Of course, the sign adds to it too. But uh, so if the way I look at it is I, I call the North Node the point of enlightenment. Because if you really master your North Node, you get a, you know an A plus in this incarnation, so to speak. And you graduate and move on to the next lesson and find deep, meaningful evolution. The North Node is a very powerful point. It's just not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, the sixth house... Um... <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not good with like 
really strict routine or like daily like i i guess i go through phases of maybe exploring like diet or like um trying like i can be i can try to be really anal but then immediately i can just be like 12th house like just float back into you know nap time or like hermit time so um it's interesting but yeah, I'm the complete opposite. Like, I love my planner. I have a routine that I follow each morning. <laughs> love being organized. No. So. Not as easy for you to surrender into the loving oh. embrace of the divine and just kind of let things flow around you. You should see me at an airport. I'm a nervous wreck <laughs> when I don't have control. Like, complete yeah. breakdown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very true. It's it's that's what's so fascinating. You know, just all these little things over time as you're learning more about astrology. And even if, you know, you're, you don't really necessarily, a lot of people don't believe in astrology, but it seems like the more they learn about it and the more they understand themselves, they're like, oh yeah, it all fits, (laughs) you know? And there's something to that, you know, even if people can't intellectually quote, believe in it, they're right. still living out their charts, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, I told you, I went into it trying to discredit it. It's like, this can't be true. How can this work? You know? <laughs> uh, and the more I studied, I was like, wow, this is powerful stuff. It's a sweet, sweet magic. Well, and- it's crazy too, just how, like, like you were saying, you have sun conjunct Neptune. Uh-huh. Um, and like, that's one placement that, you can spend a lifetime learning what that actually means. You know, that's what I'm learning with my chart is like, like my chart is basically a lot of squares between Scorpio and Leo. And I always have been, you know, I act out and just in myself and I'm, but like when you have like the terms and the symbols to be like, you are acting Scorpio this way and Leo this way, it it's like putting um vocabulary to just how you naturally are and as i get older i'm like okay yeah this is my thing this big scorpio leo square of cuz they are not yeah. they don't they yeah. jive in a way but in so many ways they are at odds with each other and that's why that's my inner conflict is that yeah. and it's like i'm learning more about that you know, with every year passing year. So it's, that's how astrology really helps. Yeah. And if you go to, uh, you get some pop astrology book, you know, off the shelf at a local shopping mall, although malls aren't really doing too well right now, mm-hmm. or you just go to a Google website. Uh, what does Leo mean? You, you get to the relationship section of the website mm-hmm. and it says, don't marry a Scorpio. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and then on the other end, uh, you know, get to the Scorpio. It's like, don't marry a Leo. And here we find this marriage built into you, you know, now in terms of intimate advice, that's pretty silly astrology. There's plenty of good, healthy, beautiful relationships between Scorpios and Leos, but it's based on this idea of these two different ways of looking at the world being very different. So -hmm. it sounds like you have a very complex chart and internal contradiction. Me too. I have Sagittarian sun directly square my Virgo moon. You know, yeah. it's kind of like we're accelerating with the brakes on sometimes. I kind of <laughs> like, I kind of like those squares though. Cause like you have to, fr- you have to figure it out. It, it's not easy, mm-hmm. but you have to like do something to come to terms with it. You know, it's a balancing act for sure. And if you're able to make that balance, you'll be able, you're able to see things from a different vantage point, you know, because you have, multiple perspectives operating within you simultaneously. And if you can feed that Leo side of you, keep it in balance and happy, feed that Scorpio side of you, keep it in balance and happy, kind of like a teeter totter, then you're able to see life pretty clearly. Mm-hmm. And with all the complexities and ironies and ambiguities of life, that's a great tool to have, you know, but squares can be challenging to find the integration of the square and the balance point through the complexity. Yeah. And in term, just in terms of, um, evolutionary astrology in general. So from your school, like the outer planets play a really big role, right? Mm -hmm. 
kind of in um, like could you kind of go into how are the outer planets viewed more diff- like from like a karmic perspective in this tradition uh from a karmic perspective or just like in general like what sort of sets them apart in evolutionary astrology well first of all disclaimer here i haven't studied other forms of astrology you know i kind Mm -hmm. of hang my hat on one and i was very much a purist about it uh now i'm um, less dogmatic about it but i'm at a point where i just don't have the time to study other systems even though i have the interest um but uh they're very similar in a lot of ways of course I look at the analysis of these planets a little differently, depending on if I'm looking at the someone's birth chart or if I'm looking at transits and progressions. Like for progressions, for example, I use the inner planets, you know, the personal planets. But for transits, I use the slower moving planets, the outer planets. So that's a little different from most, you know, the combination of uh, progressions and transits and how we view the planets. Uh, if you could make the question a little bit more specific and I could, you know, give you my, my take on them. Well, yeah, like I know, like you mentioned, um, Pluto being more important in um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Wolf Green's yeah. version of, because I have Pluto conjunct moon, conjunct the ascendant, square the sun. So Pluto uh, is here with me <laughs> for oh, life. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, just like, let's say Pluto, for example, what does Pluto yeah. represent? You're Mr. Pluto. Unfortunately. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're the God of hell is what I like to say. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> so yeah, Pluto archetypally, one of the monikers it has is the, the God of hell which kind of, a, you know, can be said in a foreboding tone. Uh, you know, and if you ask a fundamentalist minister somewhere in the middle of the country, what does hell mean? I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you, you know, it's hot, it's under the ground, you don't want to go there, you know, <laughs> yeah. eternal damnation. Uh, from the Pluto evolutionary astrology perspective, we look at that word hell and not shy away from it and say it uh, serves as a metaphor for our inner hells that we create. We can create hells or paradises. Pluto's subject matter is the hell world. It's all our hurts, our traumas, our pains that we bury in the unconscious mind, all the stinkers of life. Now, what it means to be born so Plutonian like like yourself is you're deep in psychological, basically. You have the chart of a psychological creature. You don't look at people, but into people. You know, you're a shaman, (laughs) you know, and uh, the archetypal field around the shaman is to transmute the pain of the tribe into love and light. So it's it's a strong healing component about it because ultimately it's about wounding. But the high, high destiny or evolutionary purpose of being somebody with such a strong Pluto is to help people heal those wounds. And you have psychological x-ray goggles, you know. So you have the mind of a really good psychologist, the mind of a really good private detective, you know, not career predictions, just illustrations of how you think. You want to look deeply into things, especially subjects that are psychologically charged. Now, it's an enormous intensity of being. Uh, so can you handle it? That's kind of the first question. And if you can, you become a wise and precious uh, person in your community, you know, because you're able to give incredibly sensitive, incisive insights into other people and their journeys, because we all have blinders. You know, we all have stuff we'd rather not think about. So denial, compartmentalization, rationalization, they're tremendous comforts in this world. And they're forbidden to you by your own very nature in this lifetime, but you're helping people to look beyond that. And that can be, kind of a tough path, you know, because uh, on one hand, you can have people that uh, uh, can't get away from you fast enough, you know, because if they have something (laughs) they're trying to hide inside themselves. Yeah, there's some of those. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's like they get uncomfortable being around you, 
You know, they don't want to look at those places. And that's fine. We always have to have some compassion and recognition that, you know, there's some people that don't have that level of intensity hardwired into them like you do. And then there's people who will be drawn to you, you know, that will sense you're looking deeply into yourself, but also looking deeply into them. And they'll go into confession to you, basically, and share something Plutonian or even Scorpionic something they're holding guilt or shame about because they think they don't even think they probably just intuitively feel you'll be able to help them with it because you have this zone of truth around you kind of radiating from you. So that's what it's mean, what it means to have a, a strong Pluto in your chart. But the transiting Pluto is, is, is uh, different. It's the, you know, what I mean by transiting Pluto is where Pluto is in the sky today. If it's touching a very sensitive place in your birth chart, that's known as a Plutonian event, the Pluto transit. And um, they can be pretty heavy because what happens then is, yes, Pluto represents wounding, but it's the process of healing those wounds at that period of your life, that phase. So during that period of your life, it's like work on your stuff or your stuff works on you. You're, you're ready to let go of something in that period of your life. So I'll add a little corrective to that. You're barely ready to let go of that at that point of your life. That's just the nature of Pluto. Mm -hmm. Charged emotion, trauma, pain. But the goal is transformation. It's really a beautiful planet if you don't get scared of it. Because if you transmute your pain into love and light, you transform. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that too, because everything you said resonated. And funny enough, like you're kind of, my first astrologer kind of said very similar things, you know? Uh -huh, yeah. And I was like, how did you know that? Like, what, you know? So <laughs> it's one of those cases. And I guess since we're on the subject of like reading charts, I, I know Scarlett's chart. And in terms of the outer planets, the thing that stands out in, in her chart is she she was born right at the um, Saturn Uranus conjunction, and so what would you say about Saturn and Uranus conjunct? Because that that was like a that was I guess in the eighties, you know, when that happened. Um, what do you what would you have to say about that placement? Hmm. That's a good question. I'd have to really see it within the context of a rest, or the rest of her chart, mm -hmm. you know, to tie it into the house. And the thing with the evolutionary astrology is I really like, it's like someone says, tell me about this aspect. You know, it's like, ah, yeah. it's like, show me my initial reaction. Show me the rest of the chart, you know, sure. because the level of accuracy is going to be quite limited if you just uh, talk about these energies uh, individually. So, uh, I don't know. I could look at her chart if you want now. I don't <laughs> not set up for that, but no worries. That's fine. Um, yeah. And uh, I had a question too, as we're kind of coming to a close for this interview. Mm. Um, one of the things that's been really fascinating is to see how um, the spiritual community is, is growing, especially the astrology is growing a lot of recent years and especially this year in 2020. Um, and do you see that trend continuing as we are going through um, so much turmoil globally? Do you find that more and more people are going to be searching for um, answers through astrology or doing research about astrology? Do you see this as uh, something that's going to continue? I do. I do. I think it's going to continue to grow. Uh, it's, been popular. I've seen a major surge in its popularity, especially the last five or 10 years. Yeah. Um, and about 50% based on polling of millennials believe in astrology. And they're the biggest That's crazy, group. isn't it? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Pluto and Scorpio, they need yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, they're the biggest age demographic, you know, even more than the baby boomers. So that's a big reason why astrology is so popular right now. But also, I feel like people uh, seek answers more than usual when life gets pretty tough. You know, mm -hmm. 2020 has been rough for a lot of people. 
And uh, I've seen, uh, I mean, I'm on, I have a YouTube channel and gosh, over the last uh, three months, my channel subscriber base has almost quadrupled, you know, it's like way more people are watching my videos this year. And I've heard this from other astrologers too. So of course, there's the whole lockdown piece and people have more time on their hands. But when life gets pretty rough, people some seek out answers from places they may not normally. And I think that's part of it too. Mm-hmm. But I, I do believe this trend is going to continue, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, it's the millennials being so interested in it, I think is an indication of that as we really uh, cement ourselves in this uh, Aquarian age. Yeah, yeah. Even Gen Z now, too. Um, I'm not really on TikTok very much, but (laughs) there is a huge amount of really young people talking about astrology and tarot and various other spiritual topics. So it's really fascinating to see. And I hope it does because more and more people are learning about these topics. I hope that as a whole, you know, we will kind of evolve (laughs) as a people, hopefully. Yeah, um, me too. Since that's why we're here, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess for like a closing question, what are your thoughts on um the rest of the year <laughs> in terms of astrology and where we're headed? Yeah. Well, uh the I just did a video on it a couple of weeks ago. You know, the as I'm sure you're aware, Mars just went into Aries. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, we've been feeling yeah. that around here, getting oh. in trouble. Some of yeah. me, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's some charged dynamic energy. You know, Mars rules Aries, and for those who are, are, don't know out there listening, is it's like whenever a, a planet's in its own sign, mm-hmm. it's really strong. And Mars. Uh, spends about, oh, six to eight weeks in a given sign. But because of the the timing of the retrogradations and such, it's actually going to be spending about six months in its own sign. Mm -hmm. So three times longer than normal. So we're entering into the phase of the warrior, the phase of of conflict, the phase of war. I don't think there's going to be a literal war. I think the war is... um, really tied into the nodes. Obviously, I always like to work with the nodes. Um, And we were talking about the nodes earlier. Now, if we talk about the transiting nodes, where they are now, it's affecting the collective karma. And of course, that's going to feed into the evolutionary karmic intention for us as a whole, everybody, collectively. But it's also going to say a lot about the kids being born now, you know, over the next year and a half with with the Sagittarius South node. And it's just changed signs from Capricorn and Cancer into uh, Sagittarius and Gemini. So uh, the uh, South Node being passed, the habit that we're trying to grow beyond, which we can, in that sense, look at Sagittarius a bit more darkly, a little bit more negatively, look at the bad habits of Sagittarius that we're trying to grow beyond, and then contemplate, okay, what's higher octave Gemini? the north node of the moon. The dark side of Sagittarius is basically dogma, one level anyways. So fixed set of ideologies and belief systems. The north node itself and the south node is a polarity, you know. So in terms of uh, belief systems, I think we have a lot of tribalism going on, you know, a lot of polarity of ideas. So this war that we're in over the next six months is a war of ideas, in my opinion, and uh, a war on how we perceive reality. Mm-hmm. So we're headed up to this election. I don't want to get political with it, but you know, one obvious example of tribalism would be Democrat, you know, versus Republican, you know, mm-hmm. or race, or sex, or whatever, you know, sexual mm-hmm. orientation, and the we look at Gemini. It's the sign of information. So through the law of synchronicity, we will be attracting to ourselves data in, fresh in, in information that challenges our beliefs, our fixed set of ideologies. You know, Sagittarius is the sign of religion. 
And we can be religious about cynicism or materialism. You know, we can make a God out of money or science or atheism or Catholicism or Christianity or your, your political affiliation. You know. So we're, I'm looking at this next really year and a half, but especially the next six months with this charged Mars of truth bombs, truth bombs. And I think a lot of people are going to get shaken pretty violently out of their belief systems, okay, having to look at those. Some of them won't, you know, some of them will stubbornly stay attached to them, but we're trying to grow towards high in Gemini, which is, yes, it's the sign of information, communication, journalism on one level, which is a major subject nowadays, but really the core meaning of Gemini, it's the sign of perception. So the karmic medicine, if you will, for us right now is to perceive reality more clearly. And I think some of those truth bombs, the war of ideas will provide some of that, but also ramping up will be this uh, war on our perception, how we perceive reality. And that's something that the power structures of the world have leveraged to control us, control how we perceive reality, you know, that's their greatest weapon. And that's going to ramp up during this period of war, but also people getting sick of it, I believe. So it's going to get pretty, uh, pretty charged. Um, not trying to scare people. There's a high evolutionary intention, which is becoming braver, becoming stronger. You know, that's really the, the, the path of the warrior is to face your fears, to evoke courage. Mm -hmm. So everybody's going to be feeling a little bit more martial. For those folks out there who have more martial charts or more fiery charts, more action oriented charts, they might want to scale it back a little bit, you know, that's me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, because they don't need more chili powder in their stew necessarily. And uh, maybe be aware of perhaps some self-righteousness that comes through their fervent ideas. If you tend to be a little bit more passive, a little bit more meek, you know, a little bit, um, more into, I mean, you said you were an ENFJ, that kind of makes sense, the extroverted, and now we're looking at the introverted. So the more introverted folks, maybe you need a little more chili powder in your stew over the next six months, you know, be a little bit more proactive with what you with what you believe. But the goal is always how can I perceive reality more clearly here over the next year and a half, as we're in these nodes, uh, but do it in a more evolved way. You know, where we can be assertive, but not overly aggressive and leverage the right use of force instead of just causing chaos, you know, that, that's yeah. my general take on it. No, I, that was really eloquent. And I like, because I, I mean, we even we've talked about the, the extended Mars and Aries thing happening, but really when you bring in the nodes, it makes a lot of sense that dogma <laughs> in Sagittarius versus like facts in um, yeah. Gemini. Yeah. Cause there is, this is kind of a war for how we perceive things. And um, I, I'm, I think the dogma is sort of showing its ugly face. And if, mm -hmm. if we're in the age of information and, and I feel like censorship is a, a part of that as well. I, I don't want things to be censored out because I would just want the truth sort of laid out, you know, right there. But that was a really great, um, great way to articulate it as we close this episode out. So thanks a lot for coming on the show today, Brian. And for our listeners um, who are interested in learning more about your work, where can they find out more about your work? Uh, well, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Brian Coulter Astrology. Uh, Brian spelled with a Y, you know, and then Coulter, C-O-L-T-E-R. You can find me there, uh, briancoulter.com. You know, basically uh, just my name and just plug that into Google. You'll find me. So, uh, yeah, I post uh, biweekly YouTube videos every new moon and full moon. And at the end of each of my videos, I also do a guided meditation where we we talk about the astrology energy of the next couple of weeks, and then we apply that to a guided meditation uh, to work with it more uh, directly within our, our consciousness. So, uh, yeah, if you like meditating or evolutionary astrology, come join me. Yeah, I definitely recommend Brian's videos. And uh, 
including the the meditation part is kind of my favorite part because um it's it's different than what well it's 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 like visualizations and you you do a good job you do like the binaural beats as well so um if you're looking to like learn about astrology and then at the end of the video do something proactive like a guided meditation definitely check out brian's videos yeah well it was really wonderful speaking with you today and i feel like i've personally learned a lot about evolutionary astrology um so this has been a really fun chat thanks so much uh thank you dan thank you scarlett it's been a pleasure yeah thanks a lot brian Thanks, guys, for listening to our episode with Brian Coulter. We had a great time chatting. And make sure to check out his YouTube channel because it's really it has great content, and I definitely recommend it. Um, but to learn more about astrology and follow what we're doing, you can follow our Instagram. We're at cosmic underscore keys underscore podcast on Instagram. On Twitter, we are at cosmic keys 777. Um, patreon.com slash cosmic keys to get the full forecast every week and episode extensions and support us and if you like our show uh it would be wonderful if you wrote a review for us on itunes yeah guys well we hope you all have a great week um it's gonna be a busy one it's gonna be an active one so buckle up (laughs) (laughs) definitely Yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful week ahead, and we will talk to you later. See you guys. Bye.